Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for our dinner program tonight. Hope you're having a great fiesta day at ONS. I heard it was quite a festive uh, occasion out on the streets today. Um, so our program tonight is on uh, nurses at the forefront uh, of the continuing success story of immunotherapy in non-small cell lung cancer. And very um, happy to have my colleagues with me who I'll introduce in just a second. Um, so our, uh, myself, Marianne Davies, I'm on faculty at the Yale School of Nursing coordinating the Oncology Nurse Practitioner Program. I'm also a thoracic oncology nurse practitioner at the Smilo Cancer Center at Yale. And with me, I have uh, Dr. Matt Gubins, who is an associate clinical professor uh, and medical director of thoracic medical oncology at the University of California in San Francisco. And my colleague, uh, Elizabeth Waxman, who just drove in uh, fairly locally. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner in the thoracic program um, at MD Anderson. So uh, we are going to be uh, breaking this up, kind of doing a case-based uh, approach uh, for you as we move along and talking about immunotherapy. Um, our educational goals, uh, first, um, uh, in this session, uh, we are going to be covering current and emerging roles of immunotherapies and combinations in advanced and early stage non-small cell lung cancer, you know, when and why uh, or how you make a choice about the different options we have, we have so many now, and how to explain those choices to patients because we're all involved in that. And then talk about the latest recommendations and best practices for diagnosing and managing immune-related adverse events how we educate and monitor patients and supporting them throughout the trajectory of their, uh, their treatment and their survivorship. So to get us started, I'll, we'll pass the, uh, the controls over to Dr. Gubin. So Great. thank you, Matt. Thanks so much. Uh, good evening and happy Fiesta. Really appreciate the chance to be here. I love being at ONS because really you guys are at the forefront. This is really the opportunity for those of us who are on the front lines of seeing these patients, hearing about their symptoms in real time to really affect change in how we take care of these folks. So I'm really, really happy to be here. I have a tough 20 minutes uh, a job, which is to cover why we do immunotherapy and how we do it in non-small cell lung cancer, from nothing to infinite number of permutations and combinations that have been approved over the last several years. So try to make sense of these data sets as we go. So how do we choose in the metastatic setting? We'll start with that. Let's start with a case to kind of motivate us. 78-year-old man, 35 uh, uh, years ago, quit smoking after a 30-pack year history, was found on a screening scan to have a right middle lobe mass. PET scan revealed metastatic disease, including bone. MRI was negative. He has hypertension, gout, and dyslipidemia. Though great performance status, and really his only issue is some mild left upper back pain. We do a biopsy. This shows adenocarcinoma. And on molecular testing, first of all, he has this KRAS G12C mutation, kind of another exciting area in lung cancer we can talk about another day. Um, and then PDL1 level was 0%. Just to remind you, those of you in the room who are doing oncology for a while know that really there's been an evolving change in the landscape of how we think about lung cancer. It's not that long ago that it really didn't matter. Small cell, non-small cell, we didn't have good treatments either way, and hospice was pretty much a very early choice. Then it became important to know what the histology was. We had this new drug, Pemetrexid. I'm old enough to remember how exciting Pemetrexid was. Really good, effective, and pretty tolerable chemo drug, but you had to know what kind of histology the patient had to qualify them. Now, of course, we do genomics. You send that test and you get a whole alphabet soup of alterations, genetic mutations, and fusions. Some of these drive first-line therapy, but for the majority of adenocarcinoma and almost all squamous cell, the first line is still going to involve systemic therapy that isn't targeted. And of course, that's the theme of tonight. Immunotherapy is going to play a role. It's not that long ago the immunotherapy came to the, came to the, to the, to the world. This is um, something I show sometimes. This is the New York Times the day that pembrolizumab became the first checkpoint inhibitor approved for use. Happened to be for melanoma, but lung cancer followed shortly behind. But what I love about this article in the third paragraph, you know oncologists, I'm an oncologist, cancer researchers have been almost giddy in the last couple of years. And it's kind of true, right? I mean, it's just this unbridled enthusiasm for the role immunotherapy can play. And some of you have seen these patients who have had tremendous outcomes. So very motivating, but giddy is, I think, a funny adjective. So how does it work? Just a really quick primer from your immunology days. But you know, keep in mind the T cells are the fighters, right? They're looking for a target. They're going to grapple onto that target and hopefully do the immune system's job of eradicating that target. But there have to be checkpoints. You don't want inflammation to run unchecked in your, in your body. So PD-1, PD-L1 is one of these so-called checkpoints. And in a normal body, PD-1 is 
overexpressed when it's toward the end of an injury. You want the inflammation to calm down. You have PD-1 at the edge of the placenta because you're trying to, present that, trying to protect that foreign body behind the placenta, right, the, the baby. Um, and so what this is, is in the tumor situation, is if the tumor is presenting PD-1, it inappropriately turns off the T cell, right? So it's a negative checkpoint. And that basically leads to T cell inactivation and tumor escape. But if we can then make a negative of the negative, becomes positive, now the T cell is re-energized to attack the tumor. And that's how we use these drugs, either anti-PD-1 or anti-PD-L1 therapies that can accomplish this. So especially for tumors that are using that PD-1 trick to escape detection, we cancel that negative out and make it a positive. And indeed, what we find is that for tumors that use that trick with a PDL1 expression level of 50% or higher, we have tremendous outcomes where single agent PD1 or PDL1 inhibition really clearly beats chemotherapy. And you see these four approvals. I won't dwell on the 1 to 49% approval for Pembro, but for Pembro at Tezosimiplumab, over 50%, this is a very viable option for single agent use and leave the chemo for later. But what about lower levels of PDL1? Well, here's another checkpoint that becomes important, and this is one that um, MD Anderson had a great role in discovering, a Nobel Prize for one of uh, Liz's colleagues. But out, you know, in the periphery is what we were talking about before, where the, P, where the T cells meet the tumor. This is back at the lymph node, back at the home base, where the, the, the uh, antigens are being presented to the T cells so that they can be trained to go out in the periphery. Well, again, if there's a checkpoint there, CTLA-4, T cells are inactivated and tumor escape can be accomplished. But if we can block that CTLA-4 negative signal, negative, negative, becomes a positive with the use of ipilimumab and tremolimumab, we can potentially have better T cell activation and then tumor attack out in the periphery. And again, adding drugs that employ the CTLA-4 inhibition, and here what we've done is added Nevo and Ipi as an approval, double immunotherapy, again, handily beats chemotherapy in the PDL1 1% or higher population. Do we have other options? Well, of course we do. That was on the, the question stem, and you use these in clinic every day. What's the rationale for chemotherapy combinations? Those of you who've done chemo teaching, you're telling your patient, hey, you have to be careful with your immune system during chemo, right? You're at risk of higher risk of infection. Why the heck would we give immunotherapy on top of that? Well, there's some sense to this. Chemotherapy, of course, kills the cell directly. So the cancer cell opens up, releases its contents, replaces, and kind of in, uh, it sparks off a pro-inflammatory cytokine response, and that leads to direct cancer cell death. But all that action, all those antigens being released, then feed back into those lymph nodes, into the antigen processing system, teaches the T cells that something's amiss, the alarm go, goes off, the T, shell, T cells disperse, and the T, spell, the T cells can do a more effective job of killing the tumor cell out in the periphery. So there's actually potentially not just an additional benefit, but a synergistic benefit between chemotherapy and immunotherapy when they're used correctly together. And as you see from the top of the slide, you have no fewer than seven combination regimens of standard chemotherapy with either single or double immunotherapy, all of which have been proven very clearly to improve outcomes over chemotherapy alone. So really important. And so many choices now all of them FDA approved, often for overlapping populations, how we decide when to use them. Here's a schema that I think is useful to kind of at least start to make sense of that. On the right, you have the high PDL1. For them, you have the most options. Because in a high PDL1, 50% or higher, you can very justifiably give single agent immune therapy, Pembro, Atezo, Semiplomap, even instead of chemo, hold chemo for later. You can also, though, choose to add the chemo, and you probably get a slightly higher response rate. Um, there haven't been head-to-head -head studies in this setting as yet, but these are all viable options. 1 to 49%, even though pembrolizumab, pembrolizumab is listed, it's not our usual approach. We usually do offer combinations of some sort for the 1 to 49% patients. And for the less than 1% patient, you really do want that chemo-IO combo, or at least IO-IO combo to start. So it really begs the question, all these beat chemo, but what beats each other among this list? And we don't have head-to-head -head data, and we're not going to in the near future. That's a problem, right? But we have to make these decisions in the here and now. And so I'll actually kind of throw it out to my colleagues, you know, treating at Yale and MD Anderson. How are you in your clinic, how are you and the faculty you work with making these choices? Well, a lot of it, I think, does have to do with, first of all, the first thing that's on here is disease burden. If a patient, even if they have high pd one expression, we know that the immune checkpoint inhibitors 
actually take time to actually elicit a response. So if a patient has big, bulky disease, then that's one patient that we're right away up front, we're going to say, we have to add chemotherapy because we know that they're going to get a faster response and have cytoreduction and have better outcomes. So that, that's probably the first thing. And then the other part is, do they have any autoimmune diseases that we have to be worried about? So those, are, I think, are the, the first two key questions we ask. Anything to add, Liz? And I think for us, it's looking at the patient's performance status. How much is the disease really affecting their day-to-day -day living and activities? I mean, if a person, and I see patients with PS2 and 3 just about every day in clinic, we'll probably do, depending on the PDL one single-agent immunotherapy, at least to start. Uh, I have worked with a physician who, you know, if they improve and get better, he may add chemotherapy later. But for a performance status for us, and again, as Marianne said, autoimmune diseases, tumor burden, and all of those things weigh in on how we treat the patient. It's not cookbook medicine. These are such good points. It has to do with how your patient is today, what their burden is, and also what you expect from them. Because the other kind of to leverage both these points, there are patients in front of us who if they don't get a response quickly, we're not going to get to our second line of therapy. So all these enter into discussion. It's very personalized, very much part of our shared decision making. So returning to our case, again, 72-year-old man, metastatic, adenocarcinoma, KRAS G12C, low PDL1 at 0%. Again, I'll just remind you, unfortunately, as yet, maybe ONS next year will be different, but for now, no first-line KRAS treatment, no single-agent immune therapy for PDL1 0%, but multiple of the combos are reasonable. All right, moving on to the next step. After we've kind of used a treatment in the metastatic setting, we've tried to cure, to, to, I'm sorry, to improve people outcomes. You know, we are actually getting to the point where people have five-year survival. When I started, when we all started, we were talking one to 2% five-year survival. Some of these studies, 20 to 25% five-year survival. I mean, that's in our last 10 years. We have more to do, so much more work to do, but we're doing better work and maybe some of those patients are gonna be such long-term uh, responses that maybe they are cured. I don't know, I, don't, I get careful about that C word in my clinic, but it's very exciting. But we always wanna then take these into the earlier stage because an earlier stage patient is that chance to cure. So the first step is to think about the people who are not eligible for surgery but are not metastatic. The stage threes, where maybe they have too many lymph nodes or such bulky disease that surgeries are not an option. The Pacific trial was reported out a few years ago and has really become part of our standard practice. This randomized patients to a year of dervalumab, PDL1 antibody for, uh, versus placebo after their definitive chemo radiation, where historically we've maybe cured 20% of our patients or so. And what you see is you can squeeze your finger between those two curves in overall survival and progression-free survival. This has become really our standard in this setting and has really moved that five-year outcome as we've seen these patients mature. There's more efforts here to improve those further, but that's a clear improvement between those two to add that year of immunotherapy. But what about the patients who are eligible for surgery? We've long thought about adjuvant therapy, treatment you give after surgery to hope to mop up any of the residual disease that you don't see on scan, but which you know is there because patients do recur. Or do you actually go with neoadjuvant? Do you give therapy before surgery um, and try to accomplish something before you take the patient for resection? And what you see, and we'll talk about briefly, are three approvals in this space, two ad, two, one, ad, one neoadjuvant, two adjuvant, that have, again, changed our curves enough to say this, these need to be part of our standard practice. So what are some thoughts about adjuvant immunotherapy? Why would you offer that? And we've been offering adjuvant chemo to a selection of our patients for a long time. One thing, no surgical delay. You ask a patient who was just diagnosed with lung cancer, they want you to schedule the surgery tomorrow, right? It's very hard actually sometimes in clinic to actually convince them there's some merit to doing anything else, right? Or to say, hey, the OR takes a few weeks. Like, no, now, right? So getting the surgery quickly sometimes makes sense for patient peace of mind, of course, also for symptoms. Secondly, Sometimes checkpoint inhibitors have adverse events. We'll talk about those in the second half of the presentation, but there's always that risk that you give them these therapies with the best intentions. Pneumonitis has a bad way of deferring surgery, right? And then of course, we already are in the habit of giving adjuvant chemo. It kind of, it's, it's, it feels appropriate in clinic to kind of just follow that up with more therapy. So these are reasonable thoughts about why to give adjuvant immunotherapy. Just to take a step back, maybe in your training days, uh, this was a 2008 paper. This is, I was a late fellow we were starting to think about how to prove chemotherapy made a difference, and it did. Um, and what you see in that top right corner is the five-year absolute benefit. If you go through four cycles of chemo, 
you cure about 5% of people. Five people who wouldn't have been cured would be cured. That's kind of weak sauce. And, and I admit that to my patients. And some of them choose not to do it on that basis. But it's a real benefit. And we do it, right? But I wanted to give you this slide and those little tiny curve differences and that hazard ratio of 0.84 for disease-free survival to be a comparison to what I'll show you now, which, are the, which is the statistics for adjuvant immunotherapy. So there are two studies that gave a year of, of, of immunotherapy after surgery and after chemo, if the patient elected to do that. And the first of them was atezolizumab, the PD-L1 inhibitor. Um, so atezolizumab, you can see, versus uh, a best supportive care, again, you can squeeze your finger through those two curves. There's a clear difference even at three and four years. We're going to get these data matured over time, but the hazard ratio that is much better than what we've seen for adjuvant therapy before. This is in stage 2 to 3A and pdl one positive patients. Then there's pembrolizumab. More recently came out with a study designed a little differently. Any pdl one big stage 1Bs up to 3A, and they also showed a benefit, a little smaller, hazard ratio 0.76, but again in a broader population that included non pdl one expressing patients. And on this basis, both of these drugs have FDA approval for a year of use after surgery and after chemotherapy if that's elected by the patient. These are just first two of many. There are five huge phase three trials that are going to be reporting out if they haven't already. And so we'll be getting more data. And I don't expect much different answers, but each study teaches us more about how do people of different stage do? How do people with different chemos do? How do people with different smoking statuses do? These data sets are very rich and they help us refine how we use these therapies in clinic. But stay tuned for these over the years to come. What about neoadjuvant, moving the, ther the therapy forward before surgery? Well, the argument here, as I mentioned before, some of the point of giving chemo and immunotherapy is the chemo releases the cells, the immune system hears the alarm, the T cells get engaged, and it works better. Well, maybe that's a better time to give immunotherapy than when all you've got is just kind of stragglers across the body. When you have the tumor in situ, that may actually be a more effective time for immunotherapy to work. Secondly, of course, it depends on the patient, but you haven't given chemo, you haven't subjected them to invasive surgery, their immune system may be at its strongest point at that point. Thirdly, you get a report card. When you give immunotherapy after surgery, only time tells if there's going to be recurrence. Whereas here, you get an early report card, like a midterm, if you will, where you say, how did the cells look after surgery under the microscope, in addition to following people over time? And if, with that earlier signpost, maybe we can get these trials approved earlier so patients can leverage these benefits earlier because the FDA approves them. So the first data set, the only one that has an approval, but kind of a first of many to come, is Checkmate 816. This took patients who had stage 1B to 3A resectable disease and randomized them to three cycles of either nivolumab plus standard chemo or chemo alone. And again, trying to get this early midterm answer and a final answer, they had two endpoints. The first was pathologic complete response. So when you do the surgery, you go to the pathology lab, you look under the microscope, are there any viable cells left? Because if there aren't, that's a really good predictor of having good outcomes. Secondly, event-free survival, which is kind of an earlier version of progression-free survival and overall survival, but kind of a proxy for that. And what we see on the first endpoint, the midterm test, we did great. Chemotherapy completely eradicates tumor very rarely, 2.2%. But 24% of our patients had no viable cells. Even if you cut out something that was four centimeters big and lymph nodes galore, under the microscope, they did not see any viable tissue left. Really, really compelling story. And then, of course, over time, more importantly, the patients who got the Nevo plus the chemo are very clearly doing better in terms of, of, of living without return of disease. And, of course, these data are early. Those numbers start getting small. We'll learn more as time goes on. And already, we're actually learning more. that overall survival OS is still immature. But at three years, there's a clear difference still. 78 versus 64% of people are still alive. So... We'll see these mature out, but really compelling early story. And again, just as I showed you with adjuvant therapy, there are neoadjuvant studies galore. And next uh, month at ASCO, at least two of these data sets will be reporting out, and we'll get a much richer sense of how these different approaches are working. Another kind of interesting twist is that even though Checkmate um, um, that I just mentioned did not include any adjuvant therapy, you were allowed to do it if you wanted, most didn't. Some of these trials bake in a whole year of additional immunotherapy. So we'll kind of see if there's any benefit to doing neoadjuvant plus adjuvant. Some of us aren't sure there will be. So it'll be really important to see how these studies play out. But just goes to show this area is moving fast and furious, and there are going to be a lot of data sets to assimilate. But we're already moving the needle for our patients.
So in sum, for metastatic disease, PDL1 inhibitor alone is clearly a choice for patients with high PDL1, 50% or higher, certainly, the higher the better. If not, you have the choices of PDL1 plus CTLA4 inhibition, double IO, if you will, and or chemo combinations with either PD1 alone or CTLA4 inhibition. If you have resectable disease, a lot of patients you really want to be thinking about either neoadjuvant or adjuvant therapy to really improve outcomes. And for unresectable patients who get their chemo radiation, they do warrant a year of dervalumab unless they have other extenuating circumstances. So what you're seeing is we've gone from stage four immunotherapy really to all but the very early stage patients, and all along that continuum, we are improving outcomes. So I'm really excited you're here to learn more about this and how to use these therapies in clinic, but it just goes to show how exciting lung cancer research has been the last decade. I really wanna thank you for your attention, and with this, move back to um, our, 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 our other teammates to talk about um, uh, the immuno-related uh, adverse events. Great. Thank you so much, Matt, for that. That was, it really is amazing, isn't it, how many approvals we had so, um, and continue to have. So now we're going to be talking about improving uh, the recognition uh, and management of the immune-related adverse events that do occur um, or may occur with these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I will be going through this first section. So we know that IRAEs can affect any organ system. It can affect both uh, solid uh, tumors, it can affect uh, patients' laboratory values. Um, and there is a little bit of a range though. So if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, while we know that these can affect every single organ system, um, there are different degrees at which we uh, see them. So those that are listed in the red are those that occur at greater than 10% uh, uh, incidence. Those that are in the green are one uh, to 10%, and those that are in the black are less than 1% of the population. So while they can occur, they're very, very rare, and this is across all diseases, not just uh, lung cancer. So the most common things that we see are hyperthyroidism, hepatitis, which tends to be just an uh, elevation of LFTs, uh, uveitis or eye changes, uh, colitis, diarrhea, and arthralgias, uh, and myalgias, uh, and rash and pruritus. So those are the most common that we see. Um, as far as general side effects, uh, in general, fatigue, um, pruritus, rash, uh, some anorexia. Occasionally, a patient, there are some patients that have infusion uh, reactions. Again, this is data just on uh, the use of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. We're not really merging the combination therapy in this slide, so that's an important thing to point out. When we look at the distribution of the IRAs, there is a little bit of difference between whether a patient receives an anti-CTLA-4 agent or if they receive an anti-PD-1 or PDL one So you can see by the, uh, the graphs on the right-hand side, these are grade, two, grade 1 or 2, so those are mild toxicities. Um, the green is the CTLA-4, the dark blue is PD-1, and then the orange is PDL one And then similarly, as far as the colors on the right-hand side, but these are grade 3, 4 toxicities. So on the grade three, four toxicities, in general, less than 5% of patients are having those really serious toxicities um, across the board. Um, so that's important for us to keep in mind. Nonetheless, it is important for us to understand what those toxicities are. While most of them are typically very mild, there is, the, there is um, uh, a risk of having a fatality from the immune checkpoint inhibitor. It's much lower than when we look at cytotoxic therapies. When we look at chemotherapy, the overall risk is about 1.4%, and it's under that when we're looking at uh, anti-PD-1, anti-PD-L1 agents. Um, typically, um, the onset for patients is going to be a little bit different. If we look at the right-hand side, if a patient gets combination CTLA-4 and uh, anti-PD-1 or PD-L1, the onset of uh, uh, potentially fatal toxicity is a very short window. So that's really um, the time that we have to be alert to that fact. That's about 14 days. Um, and it's a much longer, it's about 40 days if they're going to get monotherapy. And we can see on the, on the left-hand side, those things that typically cause uh, potential for fat, uh, fatalities are colitis, uh, pneumonitis, cardiac toxicities, um, and uh, also neurologic toxicities. So we'll go through some more of those, those, that data uh, shortly. There is some variability in the time of occurrence, very different than when we look at cytotoxic agents. It can be uh, really variable. It can be it can be days to uh, weeks to months after the onset or the initiation of therapy, so it really uh, reinforces to us that we have to continue to monitor these patients uh, throughout the trajectory of their illness for the potential onset of that toxicity. 
So the timing is really variable. Um, it can also uh, occur sequentially, one toxicity after another. Having one toxicity doesn't preclude you from getting another toxicity a couple of months later. So it's another thing that we have to keep in mind. And so just to kind of break it down, when we're thinking about the difference between chemotherapy or cytotoxic agents and immunotherapy, the instance, almost all patients are going to develop some level of moderate toxicity um, adverse event uh, with chemotherapy. It's usually very well described. We're used to dealing with cytotoxic agents. It's usually just a few organs that are involved, mostly the mucous membranes and the bone marrow that's going to be affected um, predominantly. Um, and the time course is really very well established. We know when we're going to see it. It's typically right within the first couple of week or two weeks after the, the initiation of therapy. Differently, immune checkpoint therapy, that is the majority of patients are not experiencing uh, toxicities from that. The uh, profile is very variable. So many organ systems can be affected. Um, and even the, the time course is variable, as I showed you on the, on the uh, previous uh, slide. There's also some other key points we need to really keep in mind. Patients may have some acute toxicities that may resolve after a short period of time, but they may have ongoing toxicities that we have to keep, continue to monitor and take into consideration as to whether or not we're going to continue therapy or not. And then the other questions we have to think through the course is, if they have a toxicity, are we going to rechallenge them? And then what is the risk in terms of tumor recurrence if we either hold therapy or if we, uh, we uh, re-challenge that patient? So we're going to go through some of the specific toxicities uh, right now, and we're going to use uh, kind of the model that was first presented by Champion, which really goes through kind of a five-step approach. How do we prevent the toxicities? How do we anticipate them, detect them, treat them, and monitor for them as we're going on with our day-to-day -day care? So I'll pass it over to Liz. Okay. So what's the nurse's role in prevention? Well, it's getting an understanding of an immune toxicity spectrum. And I like to tell my patients or my colleagues, it's any organ system plus itis. And identify immunotherapy champions within your organization, somebody who's very experienced. And at a conference like this, networking with champions outside your organizations, I'll be very honest with you, I network with one of the panelists here on immune toxicities that I've never seen before, and she graciously answers my emails. Um, patient education, how does the immune system work? Potential IRAE so that the patient and family, if it happens, they know what to do. They know who to call, when to call, and where to go if it's uh, se uh, severe. The signs and symptoms to report, the expectation of treatment, and consider the language, literacy, culture, and timing and access patient assessment, evaluate, do they have autoimmune diseases? Do they have a prior autoimmune diagnosis or prior organ transplantation? What's the risk of graft loss? Medication reconciliation, including OTC medications and herbal supplements and immunosuppressant stimulants and immune modulating agents. Patient assessment, review of systems, ROS, physical exam, and evaluate for their autoimmune risks. What's their lab sh value show, CBC, CMP? Uh, do anamylase and lipase and thyroid panel, which has become a standard of care uh, in my clinic. Um, patient education, tell them to call you if they're on any new medications. Vaccines that are inactive or killed pre uh, preparations can be given during immunotherapy. Live vaccines cannot be given. And report new symptoms. Uh, these are patient education resources. Same thing, some more resources for you, for your patients. And what's the role in detection? It's regular monitoring. Telephone triage is key. Uh, tell patients call you, do good um, assessment. When did it start? What caused it? What triggered it? Uh, you know, if it's diarrhea, did they have food poisoning? Did they eat at a restaurant and feel sick afterwards? monitor and assess the kinetics of the toxicity and determine, can, do they need to come into the emergency room? Can we do this outpatient with medications? Uh, patient education, um, close communications, report any new signs or symptoms that develop, report any uh, seen by any other healthcare provider if they're admitted to the hospital. We have patients uh, bring in their hospital records. Uh, telephone triage uh, guidelines, this is a good uh, reference. Uh, again, when did it start? What, what have you done for it? What, have you been around anybody who's been sick? 
it's important. I mean, think of it this way. 25% of emergency room visits by uh, patients treated with immunotherapy are due to IRAEs. And if we can treat it, if we can find it earlier, treat it earlier, maybe we can decrease that percentage. And for healthcare uh, implications, CMS, well, hospitals have been penalized for, can uh, uh, for patients visiting the ED because of uh, chemotherapy-related toxicities. And the rules will likely apply for immunotherapy for ICI toxicities. Uh, so consider the patient. Are they reliable and accurate, or are they a little bit histrionic? Um, is the patient able to follow telephone instructions? If not, speak to the spouse, speak to a child, speak a, a grown child, but just try to get a sense of urgency, language barriers or cognitive deficits, any comorbidities. How far does the patient live? If they're in 30 minutes, come to clinic and see, see us. Uh, do they have transportation? I had a patient call me Monday, and she's like, I don't have transportation. And I'm like, ma'am, you're dehydrated. You need to come. We need to see you. Uh, support and resources and, and follow the guidelines is the best way. Again, all of these are resources for you. And the recommendations, if the toxicity is mild, symptomatic, supportive therapy, hydrate, uh, depends on what the toxicity is. For moderate, you can stop this treatment, start oral steroids. If, if your interventions at grade two don't work and they bump up to a grade three or they start with a grade three, you're starting with intravenous steroids and referring to a specialist. Grade four, again, intravenous steroids followed by a steroid taper. Uh, and referring to a specialist and may even consider a discontinuing treatment, but that's up to the, on, uh, the oncologist and the patient. Um, guidelines for steroid therapy, taper over 30 days. Long-term is tapering very slowly over four to six weeks, which is an extraordinarily, extraordinarily long taper. And rapid taper is just not good because the patients can have a flare. So the patient is on uh, steroids for 30 days or for six weeks. You need to monitor their, their glucose. The potential for steroid-induced diabetes uh, comes up. Potential for adrenal insufficiency. So maybe during the course of the steroid taper or after it, get a, a cortisol level. Uh, muscle weakness, of course, gastritis. They should uh, be on um, proton pump inhibitor H2 blockers. Be very wary if a patient's on NSAID or anticoagulation. Of course, opportunistic infection, so you might want to prophylax with, um, I can't say it, Sobactrim or uh, fluconazole. Uh, osteoporosis, you might want to get a DEXA scan and start them on calcium carbonate over the counter. And I'm back to Marianne. So now we're going to go by uh, some of the cis, uh, symptoms. Um, so starting with dermatologic toxicity, which is actually the most common that um, can appear in the form of either rash and pruritus. Pruritus is probably one of the most under-reported symptoms that patients have, um, and yet it can be incredibly bothersome and even cause many restless nights, um, in addition to sicka syndrome. So one of the things I just want to highlight for you is that it's important not just to look at just the, the skin, but look at all mucous membranes. The patients might have a very dry mouth, and that might even interfere with their ability to eat um, and have a lot of uh, oral discomfort and then other mucous membranes. So you want patients to report any kind of dry skin, any dry skin paritis, particularly any blistering or skin peeling, which might be an indication of a more significant side effect. You want to always, with every toxicity, rule out other causes. Does this patient have a contact dermatitis? Do they have a cellulitis? Um, are, is there another allergies? The total body exam is really essential. What percentage of their body is covered by that rash or whatever that, that dis, uh, disruption is? Because that is how we grade the toxicity and it's gonna really lead to how we, uh, how we treat it. So with a mild grade toxicity, um, which is less than 10% of their body surface area, we can treat that typically just with topical steroids and sometimes topical antibiotics. With more moderate, we um, may consider adding an oral steroid if it's gone on and been more persistent for a bit of time. But with the more severe uh, toxicity covering more than a, period, their, uh, a larger part of the body, um, patients may have to start on steroids. 
Uh, dermatologic toxicities are one of those that if the patient then recovers from that, it's one of those when I would say, okay, I'm going to re-challenge them, even if they had a grade three uh, for distribution of a rash, if it was a basic rash. We'll talk about a more serious one in just a little bit. Um, but if they do have some refractory um, toxicities, if it's not responding to the steroids at the more severe, then we may have to add additional immunosuppressant agents. Um, and so we'll see that as we, as we go along with each of these toxicities. There is a small percentage of patients that can develop a more serious side effect, such as uh, bolus dermatitis, or Steven Johnson syndrome or toxic uh, epidermal necrolysis, these can be life-threatening. So if a patient comes in and even if they have a small distribution of some blistering and skin peeling, this really needs to call it, like set off the alarm bells for you. Again, you rule out all of the other causes, but this is the uh, with these situations of more serious toxicities, you want to make sure that you call in your dermatologic uh, colleagues right away to help you manage that so it doesn't get to be more serious. For the grade three toxicities, if, if they do have dress or the um, drug-induced hypersensitivity reactions or bolus dermatitis, then we permanently will discontinue the immune checkpoint uh, inhibitor. And those patients, if they're refractory, may need additional immunosuppressants uh, such as rituximab, IVIG, and even cyclosporin and some other agents um, as well. So these, again, they can be life-threatening, so we've got to keep an eye on them. GI toxicities are the, nest, the next most common. So some patients may develop diarrhea, but it has a potential to lead to colitis, which also can lead to bowel perforation. So again, it can be life-threatening if we don't get on top of it right away. So patients really need to be making sure that they're reporting any change in their bowel pattern to us, and specifically me um, measuring the amount of, uh, of output that's increased over their baseline. And I like to stress this with oncology patients particularly because many of our patients, while the guidelines are just kind of standard toxicity guidelines, they say one or two times or four to six times over baseline uh, might be a grade two. If you have a patient that's on high doses of opioids and they have opioid-induced constipation and they're going once every couple of days and now they're going three times a day, that should also kind of raise the alarms for you that that might be more serious. It may not just really be a grade one in that patient because they've had this other pattern leading up to that. So really important to get a sense of what they're, when you do the review of systems, when you're first interviewing them, to know what that change is for those patients. Um, also keep in mind patients um, can have, uh, you know, they might have a bowel obstruction too. So uh, if they just have diarrhea, you have to rule that out as another potential cause. We want to rule out that they have any other infections. Was the patient just in the hospital? Were they just on antibiotics? Do they have C. diff? So you really rule out all those other causes before you make the assumption it's just the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And keep in mind, some patients might have colostomy, so you've got to measure volume for those patients, okay? Um, pulmonary toxicities. This is incredibly challenging for our patients with, with lung cancer, particularly because they've got altered pulmonary status to begin with. So you really want to have a sense of what their baseline oxygenation is. Get a baseline oxygen level at rest and with ambulation so that that's a really easy and expensive, hardly costs anything to do that, to monitor patients if they have any change in their pulmonary status. What is their level of dyspnea? Can they climb a flight of stairs? Can they walk 20 yards? Can they walk 100 yards? And has that changed after they've been on therapy? Do they have any superimposed infections? Again, were they exposed to any other um, types of treatments? Is there another cause, such as a pulmonary embolus, or is it disease progression? So typically, for grade one toxicities, we're going to hold the immune checkpoint inhibitor. But if it's more severe, we're going to hold and then begin the infectious workup and begin a more aggressive uh, workup with a CAT scan, et cetera, to see if there's any um, uh, involvement in the lung. And typically, what it will appear as, and what the radiologist will call it, is ground glass opacities that are seen throughout the, uh, seen throughout the, the lungs. For grade three, four toxicity, where the patient's much more symptomatic and more of the lung is involved, those patients are usually hospitalized, started on IV corticosteroids, um, and with a very, very slow taper. Um, uh, pneumonitis is one of those toxicities that you typically can't just taper off over three to four weeks. It usually requires a much more protracted co uh, course of steroid uh, tapering for, for our patients. And if they don't respond in a short period of time, like uh, sometimes the, the algorithm's like three to five days from NCCN, then we increase the steroid or add an additional immunosuppressant therapy uh, for those patients. 
Endocrine toxicities are very common. These are a category that once we manage it with adequate hormone replacement, these patients can successfully go on to be rechallenged. Um, and oftentimes we don't even interrupt the immune checkpoint inhibitor um, if a patient develops uh, any thyroid or adrenal uh, dysfunction. Most patients will uh, present with a thyroid, uh, thyrotoxicosis, um, hyperthyroidism. The thyroid becomes overactive. Patients might have palpitations. If they're symptomatic, we can uh, treat them with propanolol with, for, for the palpitations. In most cases, the trajectory is then the thyroid dies out. It gets really hyperactive, and then it dies out, and it stops functioning. So initially, the patients will be asymptomatic with their hypothyroidism, but then they will become more symptomatic. They'll be severely tired. They'll say, I feel like I hit a brick wall. Um, they might be irritable. They might have other kind of uh, mood uh, alterations. And basically, what we're going to be doing for these patients is their thyroid stopped working. We have to replace thyroid hormone. So we start levothyroxine at what their normal um, basal rate would be, which is um, typically the 1.6 uh, micrograms per kilogram per day. Um, because they're not going to regain uh, their thyroid function. And that's something that we have to educate the patients about. If you stop the immune checkpoint therapy, don't stop your levothyroxine. You're going to be on that the rest of your life. Um, so again, that's just one of the teaching points when, you, when you're uh, educating your patients. Typically, we start monitoring the TSH at the beginning of therapy and then monitor it maybe every month, maybe every six weeks. Um, and once you start levothyroxine replacement, um, it's about every four to six weeks to reach the therapeutic level. So you're not going to monitor it every single week to see if it's, if it's attained its, its therapeutic level. Similarly, with adrenal insufficiency, patients will require um, hormone replacement. It's really important for adrenal insufficiency that we start corticosteroids first before we start any other hormone replacement that the patient may need so it doesn't lead to um, adrenal crisis. This is a very rare toxicity, but it can occur. So if patients are uh, presenting the sluggishness, anorexia, weight loss, irritability, visual disturbances, et cetera, we might uh, uh, do our blood work to rule out adrenal insufficiency. Those patients typically are going to be on hormone replacement the rest of their life as well. Hypophysitis, which is an inflammation of the pituitary gland, these patients typically are going to present with headaches, visual changes, What's the first thing that we think of? Do they have brain metastases? So we're going to get a brain MRI. Um, from my perspective, I have to say to the radiologist, make sure you do it with what we call cellar cuts or pituitary cuts. So the pituitary is very small. You want to be able to see if there's any inflammation in that. And again, we hold the immunotherapy, start corticosteroids. Once that resolves, these patients can su successfully go on to get their immune, uh, immune therapy. And then hepatitis, I call this a paper toxicity, an elevation in their AST and ALT is typically what we see. Rarely do we see an elevation in their total bilirubin because that's usually more indicative of either underlying liver disease or some kind of a blockage. So you want to be making sure that you're mo monitoring their ALT and AST with each of their cycles. Um, you want to rule out other causes. If you start seeing it trending up, is the patient on any other hepatotoxic agent? Are they taking a lot of acetaminophen? Um, or any kind of supplements? Are they having a lot of alcohol intake, et cetera? And rule out those causes first. Um, we, even up to grade three, we'll hold the immune therapy, and once they recover to grade one or baseline, then we can reinitiate. If a patient does have life-threatening uh, uh, elevations, then we will permanently discontinue. One point I want to make on this slide is that if a patient does develop the hepatitis uh, elevation and they have its refractory to steroids, then we will use uh, mycophenolate as the additional immunosuppressant agent that we do not use um, infliximab for hepatitis because it can actually cause a flare of, uh, of liver dysfunction. So now we'll move on to the second section. Um, so renal um, AEs, proteinuria, nephritis, and acute renal failure. Um, what you want to do, monitor the serum creatinine, you know, CMP, urine protein, creatinine ratio, um, see if they have azotemia, rule out other causes. Are they taking any herbal supplements, any other drugs you don't know about, NSAIDs, antibiotics, anything? Did they have a reaction with contrast dye? Are they dehydrated? Even an infection. So for the mild, you can continue uh, your immunotherapy, and you might want to just follow a urine protein creatinine. 
Um, if it's not changed, consider renal for moderate. Then you're going to hold and consider renal biopsy and start prednisone. Um, basically, you're just going to keep following the urine protein creatinine ratio throughout this nephritis for severe prednisone, nephrology consult, grade four. You're going to stop the immunotherapy because at that point, the creatinine is six times above the upper limit of normal. But here's the key. If, uh, it, if the renal function remains greater than grade two after four weeks on steroids, uh, consider cyclosporin, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, infliximab, or mycophenolate. And you just need to keep track of your patient's creatinine. Yeah. Um, and these increases can be very incremental. Cardiac, monitor blood pressure, EKG, echocardiogram, uh, troponins, uh, BNP, ESR, CRP, and rule out patient have arrhythmia. Did they have an MI? For mild to moderate, you know, keep an eye on them. But for grade three arrhythmia, um, per grade three, grade four, it's a permanent discontinuation of the immunotherapy. And I will tell you, I've not yet had a patient in the grade three or grade four uh, cardiac ICI. Rheumatology, arthralgias, arthritis, joint swelling, arthritis flare. All my patients come into me, it's like, ah, the arthritis, the knee, the hips, the shoulders, and it's, let's take it. Physical exam, joints, look at their gait, have they altered their gait? You can do some rheumatologic testing, ANA, a rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, again, sediment rate, CK and CRP. It, you can do a joint ultrasound, especially if there's any swelling in the joint and looking for any fluids. Uh, again, rule out other causes. Do they have a lytic lesion you don't know about? Do they have an iliac a metastasis? Do they have an infection? Is it gout that's flaring? Uh, if they're young enough, were they out on a sport injury and have an ACL tear? So mild or moderate, continue the, the uh, ICI. If it's worse and it's limiting their uh, ADLs and there's joint swelling, consider an anti-inflammatory drug. Uh, for grade three, you're going to hold the immunotherapy there, maybe get an MRI of the affected muscle, start your prednisone, um, even maybe refer to orthopedists if it's really bad uh, in, term, in terms of joint swelling. Um, grade four is a discontinuation. Consider IVIG or plasmapheresis, infliximab or rituximab. But again, I've not yet had a patient get to grades three or four. It's mostly been, honestly, grade one. Has that been your experience? Okay. Neurologic, neuropathy, weakness, myasthenia, Guillain-Barre and myositis, um, neuro, muscle strength, do, do they have good uh, functional assessment, EMGs if, if necessary, um, rule out of the causes, diabetes, thyroid, um, I have a couple of patients, this is an aside with thymoma, who have uh, myasthenia as a perineoplastic syndrome. So again, just make sure they don't have some other issue in addition to lung cancer, although that's going to be very rare. So mild, grade one, continue the ICI. Grade two, you're looking at some sim sensory issues, some limitations in the radial. Going to stop or defer the immunotherapy, start prednisone. Uh, if progression, start methylprednisone, gabapentin for pain, grade three or four, uh, get them into physical or occupational therapy for assisted devices, discontinue the immunotherapy, uh, inpatient care, maybe they need to be transferred to ICU for a higher level of care, IVI or, or plasmapheresis is done, uh, monitor for concurrent auto, autonomic dysfunction, also if they're in the hospital with severe muscle weakness, get uh, rehab, PT, OT involved so that they can have some muscle strength or start working on muscle strength. Ocular, IEs, uveitis, iritis, sicka syndrome, conjunctivitis, you know, perla, uh, reactivity, look at the uh, red reflex, pupil size, fundoscopic exam. Again, rule out other causes mild, grade one, continue, or can hold it until it's improved, grade two, ophthalmology evaluation and hold the ICI, 
maybe ophthalmology of prednisone. Pancreatic, I'm going to have you read the slide because I am just running out of time. So back to Marianne. Okay. And the storms are starting. So <laughs> um, fortunately, now we get to think about some of the survivorship issues with our patients. So just a quick uh, word on this. Right now, a lot of people ask, and I think there's a question on here, you know, what is the consensus for how long we should be treating our patients? And we're not exactly sure. A lot of the studies stopped maybe after two years. Um, some of the adjuvant or neoadjuvant have very fixed amount of times we're treating. But for metastatic disease, some people are staying on it for even longer if they're having therapeutic outcomes. But it's really important for us to educate our patients about that on an ongoing basis, and we continue to have that shared decision-making. Important to keep in mind that the longer you stay on the therapy, the higher you have a longer risk of developing those IRAEs. So again, it's not something that if you didn't have it the first cycle, you're never going to get it. So that's one thing that we really have to keep in mind. Um, so some key takeaways for IRAE treatment and management is that nurses we know are integral to the identification, monitoring of these IRAEs. Persistent grade 2 IRAEs and grade 3 or 4 are treated with corticosteroids. The use of those standardized algorithms really are essential and very beneficial. And I know ASCO, NCCN, CITSI, all of those organizations, I've been a part of some of those boards, and they've really made a point of collaborating to make sure that there is consistency across the recommendations so as not to get people confused. We know early discontinuation of steroids may increase the risk of relapse or progression of the symptoms, so you don't want to rush it. This is not a steroid dose pack. Tapering of the steroid should be carried out under direct supervision. The reinitiation of that ICI may be possible with optimal management, so that's really important. And there was a question, I'm just going to take this opportunity to answer it now. Somebody said, you know, what happens um, if, if, is there an opportunity, um, like what happens during that break? And there actually have been studies that have been done that have shown that even if patients take a break, if you've activated their body's immune system enough to have those, those toxicities, they still maintain their therapeutic benefit from the immune checkpoint therapy. So it's actually okay and it's better to stop and, and resolve that before restarting. All right, now we're going to go on to some cases to kind of apply what we just did. So the first case is a patient, a 63-year-old gentleman, stage 3A squamous cell, non-small cell lung cancer of the left upper lobe. So again, he's a stage 3. Remember what we talked about for treatment for him. He also has a prior history of bullous uh, emphysema, and he's got some other uh, comorbid medical conditions, including having had COVID before he started therapy. So because he's stage 3, he started concurrent chemotherapy uh, with carboplatin, paclitaxel, and radiation therapy, and this was followed by dervalumab. Um, based on the Pacific trial, and that's every four weeks. Um, it can be given every two weeks, just in case, you know, just as, as an aside. Um, and just at, um, when he came in for cycle number three of the Dervalumab, uh, he had reported that he had a one-week history of worsening dyspnea and cough. He also had, um, on review of system, right calf swelling, dyspnea with walking short distances, palpitations, hadn't been able to work because of the dyspnea and the fatigue, and on your exam that you did, you do see, um, you know, that he does have that right leg calf edema. He has very coarse breath sounds throughout both lungs with the left greater than the right. Um, and again, he endorsed the shortness of breath. So I'm going to ask my colleagues, what are your considerations when you see this patient that comes in with this report? What are your differential? You've definitely set up this patient, you know, he has emphysema, he has aspiration to start with. He just got chemo reds. So, you know, this is a guy who's a setup for a lot of things to happen. Obviously, we're in this room, we're talking about pneumonitis, so I'm thinking about the fact that he's finished chemoradiation relatively recently, and the window for radiation pneumonitis, even distinct from immune, radi 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 immune uh, pneumonitis, is you know, often three to six months, so that's on my list. I see right calf swelling, I'm thinking pulmonary embolism. You've got to think about infection with the acuity of onset. Um, and also, always in the back of my head, I'm also thinking about uh, disease progression. You know, these are patients with lung cancer, and sometimes we do see um, progression on that time frame. So these are some of the considerations that need to be kind of sussed out and what makes lung cancer hard to <laughs> suss out when it's a pulmonary symptom. Oh, absolutely. Um, so those are the first things. When we go back to our algorithm that we covered before, the first thing is rule out other causes. And he may, keep in mind, have more than one cause, which is possible too. Does he have infection? Does he have disease progression, pulmonary embolus, a pleural effusion, um, pulmonary fibrosis, radiation fibrosis, et cetera? So this patient, when we really look at, you know, what is the picture of immune-mediated um, pneumonitis, the incidence is relatively low. It's about 3 to 7%. It is higher in pdl one and PD-1 inhibitors, 
median onset is about 60 to 90 days after the onset. So he's coming in for his third cycle, so it's about 60 days. It's a very high mortality. That's what I want to point out. One of the reasons we have to really jump on top of it. So 20 to 30% mortality. And the patient has, is pretty much exhibiting the symptoms that we described. So we did his oxygen saturation, which we talked about before. It was 94% at rest. Previously, it had been 97, and it dropped to 87 with ambulation, and it improved with, uh, with the oxygen. So we already said he had coarse breath sounds. The Doppler ultrasound was negative. Um, a chest CT did show that he had new consolidation throughout the left lung with worsening ground glass opacities bilaterally and new tree and bud opacities in the lower lobes, which sometimes indicates like an infection. So there's a concern for pneumonitis, and some of the areas may have also been related to the prior radiation field. But increased uh, GGOs, or those ground glass opacities on the right, which is the opposite lung, um, could mean that this is uh, an indication of the immune-related uh, pneumonitis. So if we go to our algorithm, where do we think this patient fits in based on his symptoms? He walked into clinic, but he's clearly symptomatic. Where are we thinking he fits in here? What would we treat him with? Any... I think he's more of a, a grade two. Absolutely. So that's where he really, he really fell uh, in. So what did we do? We held his dervalumab. We started prednisone. Because he was hemodynamically stable, we started oral uh, steroid. We didn't feel that we needed to start IV. So he started uh, prednisone 60 milligrams a day started on the Bactrim for PJP prophylaxis and pantoprazole to present, uh, prevent the gastritis. When he initially, we bring them back frequently because you wanna make sure that they're responding to the steroids. So you monitor these patients very closely. So we brought him back. He initially had improvement in three days, improved oxygenation, decreased uh, symptoms. And so the following week, uh, week, we began to slowly taper off the, the prednisone. Unfortunately, when he came back at one month, he had worsening dyspnea at this point, decreased activity level, a low-grade fever, increased oxygenation uh, uh, requirements. So at this point, again, we tapered him off over a couple of weeks, and that was too fast. So that's kind of the teaching point here. It was, it was too fast for this gentleman. So we hospitalized him. We did a pulmonary consult. We did an infectious disease consult. He then started on the IV equivalent of the steroid, so the methylprednisolone, one milligram per kilogram per day. And then he had prophylactic antibiotics uh, while we were ruling out infection. And then because he wasn't responding to the steroid, then we right away started the infliximab. So for those of you that are inpatient or even outpatient, sometimes infliximab takes a long time to get approved through insurance companies, which is really a struggle. I hate to talk about finances, but if we think a patient is already starting to be like demonstrating that they're gonna be refractory, we start getting it ordered and get through the prior authorization um, as quickly as possible so that we don't run into an acute situation. So this patient did have, um, when he had his evaluation, he had a bronchoscopy and bron uh, bronchial alveolar lavage as well. He had mild um, uh, acute inflammation. He did not have any um, superimposed infection. Um, and when he came back at his CT scan in September, actually it showed that he was uh, stable. But unfortunately, on this, on this CT, he had worsening GGOs um, and also had worsening of his... his um, his emphysema. So by October, the fortunate part for him is that he continued to have disease response, which was good. He had post-radiation changes in the left lung, um, and the right lung opacities began to slowly improve. Um, however, there were new on the left-hand side, and that's when we felt that that was really more consistent with radiation fibrosis. And so the reason I bring up this case is just because this is not always clear cut. You might like manage one thing as far as the pneumonitis, but now he might be challenged with radiation fibrosis for a more protracted period of time. Go ahead. One thing yes. is also that, you know, the, obviously you hopped on it. He had, he had the symptom that emerged over a week, but I really do tr tell my patients to be very quick to tell us. I think patients sometimes hold up, I'll see him in a few weeks and I'll report my symptoms. Mm -hmm. The longer pneumonitis festers, the less likely it recovers to full strength. Um, there's a lot of fibrosis that gets laid down so that even if you recover from the acute pneumonitis, you get left with some respiratory dysfunction. So again, early and often, I order more CAT scans than I ever did before, but I think sometimes you obviously you assess it in triage, but I'm, I, I really want to make sure that patients get that attention quickly. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that patients often do will say, I think I have a cold or whatever, I'm gonna to go to my PCP, I'm gonna to go to an urgent care center, and then they wind up getting started on an inappropriate therapy, like get, you know, getting their antibiotics when really what they need is the steroids. So 
We really stress with them, call us. We should always be your first line. Call us first with, let's rule out the worst thing first before we just move on to the other, the other kind of managements. Thankfully, post-COVID, a lot of people have pulse oximeters at home, or they're very accessible, <laughs> right? So that becomes a very important tool, too, for triage. Yeah, absolutely. So. All right, this is an, another challenging case. Um, this is a 74-year-old gentleman. He's got stage four non-small cell lung cancer. He's got a history of hypertension, arthritis, um, cardiovascular, uh, a CVA in the past, um, a prior history of a, a melanoma as well. So this patient got uh, one cycle, one cycle of chemotherapy and pembrolizumab, came into the clinic with congestion, cough, comes into the, or, our urgent care center. And he said, two days ago, we started having really diffuse myalgias and in the shoulders, the back, the thighs, feels like his muscles are just so overworked um, and that they're tender, despite the fact that he's really not physically active. He's got a pretty sedentary lifestyle. Um, says he's short of breath with physical activity, especially climbing stairs. Um, he's got some leg swelling bilaterally. Um, and when you are doing your exam, he's got an irregular um, heart rhythm. He's got one plus pitting edema bilaterally. What are you thinking about, Liz and Matt, for these potential causes? Any thoughts? Maybe pneumonia, maybe even the flu with myalgias and arthralgias, maybe something not yet ICI related and something that should be certainly evaluated. But I, I would consider, well, with the SOB with physical activity, I would certainly get a pulse oximeter, a walking uh, O2 evaluation and just see where that leads you. Chest X-ray baseline. But I'm not fully endorsing an ICI toxicity at this point. Right. Any new irregular heart rhythm buys some extra attention, yeah, right? I yeah. mean, but I think you're right. You can have paroxysmal AFib that pops yeah, out because you're right. infected, but you got to scratch your head and say, something's going on. You have new edema, you have new irregular heart rhythm. So obviously we know where we're going with this in terms of an ICI, but something's going on that's stressing that heart. We really need to get to the bottom of it. Yeah. And without any other infectious symptoms, other than yeah. the congestion, the cup, but he's like total body aches. All the muscles are really sore and like really excessive. Um, yeah, some people can have that with the flu, but um, you want to make sure that that combination you're really looking at. So we are going down the path of an ICI-related toxicity, obviously. <laughs> um, it's a very rare toxicity, um, myocarditis. The instance is about 0.04 uh, to 1.14%, depending on the population. Very high mortality can be upwards of 50% mortality. The median onset is 30 days. So the key here is, remember that, that slide I showed you about those fatal toxicities? The really acute fatal toxicities tend to occur, occur earlier on. They tend to not be you know, months and months later. Not that they can occur then, but they tend to be earlier on. Um, but the patients can also have clusters of other symptoms with the myocarditis. Um, again, the workup, you want to have an immediate cardiology consult. Any of our patients that come in with these generalized significant myalgias um, and heart issues, we get a troponin level, we get their, um, their, a BNP, a CK level, we get a chest X-ray, an EKG, an echocardiogram, um, and then all, usually we'll put an order in for a cardiac MRI because even though it might take us a little bit of time to get it, our cardiology fellows always want it, so we just order it because we know they want it. Um, and we start steroids as soon as possible. This is one we have to jump on. And typically, it's a different dosing of the steroids than what we do for the other toxicities because it's so fatal. Um, it's the methylprednisolone pulse dosing, a much higher dose at 1,000 milligrams IV daily for three days. And then we go to the other dosing if they respond. But if they don't respond within 24 um, hours, we barely even give them 24 hours, and we right away add a secondary immunosuppressant agent. And obviously, these patients are definitely hospitalized while we're, while we're working this up. Um, unfortunately, I've had a few patients that have had this that um, it's kind of scary. Um, this patient um, also had significant elevation. So he had kind of multi-organ involvement. Um, so his transaminases, the ALT and AST, were very elevated. Troponin, BNP, CK, everything was, um, was elevated. He had atrial fibrillation on his, on his EKG. Um, so again, he started on the steroids, he started on the heparin drip because of the AFib, he was on telemetry, he had serial EKGs and uh, troponin levels, 
Um, the echo showed a drop in his EF, it was 53%, which doesn't sound terribly bad for some of our patients, but it, for him it was like it was a significant drop. Um, and so at the time in the hospital, we were running some different clinical trials looking at, you know, do we start, you know, he's already on the steroid, do we add another immunosuppressant agent or do we want to look at a beta sept, which has now been recommended um, for use for, it's another immunosuppressant agent specifically for the myocarditis. Um, so unfortunately for this patient, his troponin levels increased um, despite four days of high dose steroids. So he's already letting us know that he's refractory. Um, this is just, a, I'm gonna, there's a lot of different slides on myocarditis that are in your slide set that we didn't show. And I'm just going to kind of go through this one too, because we're going to go through um, uh, the, the information in general anyway. Um, there's also um, significant clusters of more acute major adverse cardiovascular events that can occur in these patients uh, that have the myocarditis, and they're called MACE. So this is one particular um, study that looked at, was a retrospective study looking at about uh, almost 7,000 patients that had been on an immune check, uh, PD-1, PD-L1 therapy. Um, and uh, about 0.6% uh, of those patients actually developed uh, an immune checkpoint-related MACE, or major adverse cardiovascular event. Um, and those patients, uh, unfortunately, um, most of them had multi-system involvement. It wasn't just um, isolated. Um, even though it was a small percentage of patients, almost all of them had multi-system involvement. And the patients that had the more severe cases had concurrent myositis, and those patients all died. So remember we talked about a significant muscle aches and pains that went along with it? So, an, you know, kind of a trigger to think about my, uh, myositis in those patients. So there, we call it the triad that occurs with the my, myocarditis. So myocarditis, myositis, it can occur also with myasthenia gravis. So if you see that myocarditis, then we, we re, right away do the workup for all three of those things. Um, and the, um, the treatment is going to be very similar. The high-dose corticosteroids and initiation of a secondary corticosteroid um, very, very uh, quickly. While we have a general idea of the occurrence of myocarditis, um, the, actually the clustering or that triad, um, because it's not reported out um, kind of accurately or, or consistently across all institutions, we don't really have um, a, a true uh, really estimate of the occurrence for that. So going back to this patient, this is a really unfortunate patient. Um, he continued to decline despite high-dose um, corticosteroids. He uh, went on to secondary agents such as mycophenolate, IVIG, a beta sept. Um, he wasn't eligible for the clinical trial, but we were able to get it anyway. Unfortunately, um, he wound up intubated and um, uh, eventually uh, did lead to his uh, demise. And that was 15 days after presentation. Um, and so, yes, it's a very sad case. It's very, very unusual. But just to, again, try to alert people that these horrible, like, serious side effects can occur and you have to jump on them. And so um, that's part of educating, I think, our staff on the telephone triage. If a patient calls in and they've got these generalized other symptoms of total body ache, myalgias, and, and whatever, and now, you know, some palpitations, get them in and do the appropriate evaluation, not just to kind of shrug it off as something else. Um, and so here, this is just everything that he went through was right in line with the NCCN guidelines as far as the additional immunosuppressant agents uh, to use. Um, so really some challenges we have. It's a cautionary tale. How do we improve um, our outcomes? And a, a part of that is in, you know, really improving our awareness and education. It's one of the reasons we're here is to make people aware of these things that can occur um, and really stress that the early recognition of these IRAEs can uh, hopefully, hopefully lead to better uh, outcomes. Um, and really important to get good baseline uh, understanding of a patient's cardiac status and past medical history to hopefully uh, help you understand patients that might be at risk uh, for these. Okay, and I'll pass it over to Liz. Okay. So case study number three, 57-year-old female, came to, went to her PCP in June 2017 with an enlarging right scalp lesion. It was biopsied and pathology showed a Metastatic adenocarcinoma, CT brain, showed lytic lesion of the right occipital bone and adjacent soft tissue mass, and there was another lesion in the left frontal cortex. Uh, there was also uh, some small, I guess, vasogenic peripheral edema found. Uh, CT chest further workup, she had a left upper lobe mass, 4.3 centimeters, 
and the 3.4 centimeter left adrenal uh, mass, and it was consistent with metastases. And she also had an indeterminate nodule in the right adrenal. Uh, MRI brain showed multiple brain metastases. So in her biopsy, we did mutation testing, and she had no driver mutations, and her PDL1 was 20%. And she was in good, good performance status, PS0 to 1. So her treatments included uh, radiation, whole brain radiation, 3,000 centigrade, and she started with systemic treatment with carboplatinum, pemetrexid, pembrolizumab uh, after completion of radiation and recovery. Uh, so she had six courses of triplet therapy and transition to maintenance, pembrolizumab and pembrolizumab in January 2018. So with the triplet therapy, she had some fatigue, she had nausea, she took her antiemetics, uh, she was still able to do her ADL, so her fatigue uh, she worked through, but on uh, the maintenance therapy, she had complaints of diarrhea, and it was initially two episodes daily for five days. She didn't take anything for the diarrhea, uh, even though she was counseled to take something for the diarrhea and to contact the oncology team. Uh, by this time, she had had eight cycles of maintenance therapy. Um, when she came into clinic, we said, you know, you need to take your antidiarrheals, you need to hydrate with fluids, and we also gave her a prescription for uh, diphenoxalate and atropine. And, you know, again, this lack of communication caused this patient delayed in treatment. So, and she did still get the pembrolizumab at this point. So at the next clinic visit, cycle 10, she still had complaints of diarrhea. She was taking the pres uh, prescribed medication. She was staying hydrated. She didn't have a bump in her BUN or creatinine. She didn't have any poor skin trigger. But she ended up being hospitalized in May for dehydration, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, she was treated with fluid, IV fluids, antiemetics, antidiarrheals. And she had a GI consult for what was then an immune, a suspected immune-related colitis. And uh, our gastroenterologist uh, performed a colonoscopy and just found her entire colon was inflamed. And uh, she, she was put on a steroid taper and discharged. And uh, this particular gastroenterologist, um, she, she used ventilizumab. And I, at this point, I was arguing with my attending because I was saying, I think we have to stop the pembrolizumab. And he's like, no, Liz, we're going to continue. So <laughs> he's got guts, but <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Goofins, would, would you have? I mean, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. <laughs> So in general, if I'm starting steroids, if it's that level, that acuity of IRAE, I really do tend to take a break at least. Yeah. I'll keep it, the option open of re-evaluating, re restart. But that, that is the juncture point. She's been hospitalized. She started on a staper. We're talking about kind of more novel autoimmune drugs. I, I would have stopped. And the other thing is that as, as, as we, as Brianna alluded yeah. to before, patients who have had a benefit and develop an IRAE often sustain that benefit. So yeah. there's... Yeah almost more harm than good to be had for at least in the short-term period, leaving it on. I'll, I'll admit. Well, I'll do respect. <laughs> I, I mean, it's fine. I mean, he, he and I just, I don't think it got stopped. But the point is that her diarrhea did abate with the steroids. And I, I have to say, and the vendalizumab, and the gastroenterologist in this patient's uh, care is very passionate and uh, our person we request when we consider uh, immune-related colitis, and I think she's... Yeah. DCN board for the <laughs> guidelines for yes. colitis. And uh, to be honest with you, she said, she literally said, yes, you can continue uh, pembrolizumab. Um, on the repeat colonoscopy, after three vedolizumab infusions, there was improvement in the inflammation. The colitis was still present. The diarrhea had slowed. But she was able to, the patient was able to continue her maintenance therapy. And there is one thing on the vedolizumab. It's a very weird uh, scheduling, but the patient, once they're on maintenance vet, vendolizumab, it's given every eight weeks and the day after treatment. So the patient comes in twice, two days in a row for treatment. Um, interestingly enough, on PET-CT, she had disease control in the lungs, the adrenal, the brain. And she had a lesion in the liver that was just not responding to treatment. And so we biopsied it, and she had a neuroendocrine carcinoma. Uh, 
and we had to change treatment altogether at that point. So I presented this just as an unusual case, and you can still treat with immune-related colitis. I personally would have stopped, but I'm not an MD. Um, communication, in this case, and this is an important take home, the patient did not contact the oncology team. There were no phone calls, there were no my chart messages, there was no communication about the diarrhea, the nausea, or the vomiting, none. So that delayed us in getting her the right treatment. Also, she also did not take, even though we counseled her, get diarrhea, start something over the counter, just start it, let us know if it works. She did not do that because she's like, I thought it would go away. And I'm like, well, it didn't. And so please counsel your patients. Uh, so patient education is crucial. Uh, and again, in this case, we did have multi multidisciplinary team. So the next patient, 69-year-old female, and uh, June 2018 was a big year for uh, patients and immune-related toxicities for me. Went to her PCP, felt a supraclavicular node on self-exam, had a biopsy thinking it's breast cancer. Lo and behold, it's uh, adenocarcinoma. It was actually a non-small cell lung cancer, and then further testing was an adenocarcinoma, extranodal extension, and lymph lymphatic space invasion. She has past medical history of diabetes. She's on two drugs, and it's controlled. Uh, imaging studies, two centimeter right of lobe nodule with primary lung malignancy, small pulmonary nodules. We weren't certain, but we uh, presume they are metastatic lesions, uh, intrathoracic, intrathoracic, extrathoracic nodal metastases, hepatic and osseous metastases, MRI over the brain was negative. PDL1 uh, testing was 80%, 80 to 90%. Uh, driver mutations, gene mutations were not found, and her performance status 90%. So this is her baseline PET CT. And all of this is her disease. So she started on triplet therapy. She also receives zoledronic acid for osseous metastases. And her baseline, this is where you used, her baseline creatinine was 0 0.6. And at cycle number two, it bumped up a bit to 0 0.94. On cycle three, it really bumped, and so we gave her IV hydration. She felt absolutely fine. She was active doing her ADL. She told me, Liz, I, I can't, I'm drinking so much. I'm, uh, I, I, she's basically living in, her, in the ladies' room, but she was staying hydrated. She was doing what we told her to do. At cycle number four, the creatinine responded to the fluids, and she stayed on treatment. And we did keep doing IV hydration with her treatments. And so this is after cycle two. And this is why we, keep, we kept at it. Uh, and she finished four cycles and went on to maintenance pembrolizumab. But she still had, you know, her creatinine kept creeping up, creeping up, and it peaked at 1.84. Uh, and we were hydrating her, so we stopped the zoledronic acid a UA was negative for WBCs. Protein was 100 milligrams per DL. We did give pembrolizumab uh, with hydration, and uh, her creatinine was 1.41 two weeks later. So we said, I'm going to give you treatment. You're going to go home. You're going to get a creatinine. We also, because of this wavering uh, creatinine, sent her to renal. And our team in renal did a needle biopsy, and she had interstitial nephritis with rare eosinophils, and she had two, a, a Q tubular injury with mild tubular necrosis and nephrosclerosis. She had a lot of sclerosis. And she also had fibrosis with tubular atrophy. And so our renal team said steroids uh, because she had such a good response. We want to keep the treatment going, but we can try a course of steroids. And so we did steroids after each pembrolizumab, and at first it was a 10-day taper, and then we cut it down to eight days to six days, and after each treatment, it was a five-day um, five steroid treat, uh, taper. And so her creatinine responded. Now, I have to say, in a couple of months later, she was still followed by the nephrologist because her creatinine never came down to baseline. It was coming down. We were happy with that, but our renal team wasn't, and 
they were really a, about, they were getting ready for the infliximab, and I'm just wondering, Marianne, are your, any takes on this? Or? No, I, well, I'm not sure we would have continued the immune therapy at that point, too. That's really a novel approach with the corticosteroids, but I know that there's a lot of novel approaches being used now because really we based a lot of the guidelines on how we treat autoimmune diseases, other autoimmune diseases. So we're just beginning to really now kind of peel back the onion and say, all right, are we doing it the right way? Are there other ways that we can manage these? And I'm seeing at some bigger centers some creative ways of kind of going off guideline. I don't think I would recommend it for people that are at other centers where you don't have access to a yeah. lot of uh, specialists. I think that would be the key, my key recommendation. Dr. Gubins, any thoughts on this, just I, in general? Just in general, is I, I think it underscores the point that when you're managing these immune-related AEs, you have to have your Rolodex full of phonofriends, and you have to have that specialist in each of these groups. Where I can manage thyroiditis pretty easily. I'm pretty <laughs> confident about that now, but... I. I I'm granted, I haven't quite followed this approach with a nephritis, but I would want my nephrologist to be the one guiding but, that who knows the context. But yeah, that yeah. is who uh, guided exactly. us. And I have to say yeah. it was really because she had such a fantastic response. Yeah. They were saying, yeah. we re really shouldn't keep it. So my patient and this, uh, was able uh, to finish her maintenance treatment in June 2020. She, again, she uh, has no active disease, and the most recent creatinine was 1.02. And this is her latest, and this is not disease. This is her heart. These are her kidneys. She's doing fine. I mean, um, she, before being diagnosed with lung cancer, she sang in her church choir at Christmas. And this past Christmas, she was singing in her church uh, choir again at Christmas. So I guess for us, uh, I mean, I was personally very scared taking care of these patients with these toxicities. But early action, early intervention, with help from other services, GI, renal, you can keep a patient on treatment that is working, not necessarily to their detriment in terms of other organ right. systems. Um, and we've got some time for some questions. I was just going <clears> to <throat> give Liz a little break for a second. So um, there was a question about how often do you see dermatologic IRAEs when you're re-challenging post-steroid therapy? There was actually have been a couple of studies now that have looked at um, specifically re-challenging post-steroid um, managed toxicity. Um, and it's a very, very small percentage of patients that actually have recurrence of these toxicities. You may get another toxicity, but in general, um, once you have a, a resolution of a toxicity, it's safe to go ahead and, and, and re-challenge. And they, they may, again, have another toxicity, but not necessarily, not necessarily mm -hmm. that one. So I'd qualify that a little bit. As with anything, it depends on what that toxicity right. was. Because I'm, right. I'm much more confident retreating a diffuse rash than mm -hmm. a bullous pemphigoid. Absolutely. Um, a pneumonitis that required steroids. I, I'm having a pretty big risk-benefit analysis with that patient. Yeah. Maybe I've tried an intervening chemotherapy line before I go back to that. Right. Some recidivism rate, but it could be dangerous when it happens again. Right. So I, I, I point taken, but I think it's always a give and take. I, I right, think it depends on, on what the, exactly yeah. how significant the toxicity yeah. was. But some some people have tried it, and it's you can actually yeah, definitely. maybe not necessarily have it back. <laughs> um, the other one, just do you recommend a baseline TSH prior to starting immune, immune therapy? That is in the recommendations um, to get a baseline TSH, and then typically we're doing it every. Uh, four to six weeks, um, depending on the patient's cycle or if they're symptomatic. And then I think I'm going to pass over to Matt. Kind of also on the line of kind of baseline testing. Someone asked a really good question. You, you heard a very dramatic myocarditis type case. Do you do baseline troponins at your institutions? I think so. We don't. We do if a patient oh. has a cardiac history, okay. but that's usually that, that's the trigger, is if they have an underlying yeah. cardiac history, but not for the general population. Yeah, and we, we don't either, but I think, I think we're thinking more about that. And I think the key of the case was just to have that early suspicion, because mm -hmm. you have tools like troponin and CPK and BNP that are quick to get and quick to kind of help us move our differential along. Right. Right. Perfect. I also think it takes one patient with one... <laughs> ICI AE that you haven't <laughs> seen. I, I mean, I honestly haven't seen a myocarditis, and so now I've learned. And then you became become very aware, very cognizant, and try to get the labs ordered ahead of time, and and try to uh, establish better communication with the patient and family. Right. 
There's one challenging question here. Somebody said, you know, who actually monitors and manages, manages patients with these IRAEs? Um, and if you don't have, you know, with all these different specialists, and that's really going to be institution specific. We all work at large institutions, so we have the luxury of having a lot of subspecialists available that are in close proximity, and many of which are doing research on really and have a special interest in managing these immune-related toxicities. Some institutions have an um, IO toxicity um, clinic. Some have a group that goes around to see patients in the hospital. So there's some different models that are out there. But for people that are living in the, in the community that are not near a major in, uh, institution, it is really a challenge. So how do you establish those relationships with people in the community that is the cardiologist and the rheumatologist and, and whatnot? And I think it's really just trying to build those, those networks of, of specialists in your community so you have somebody to call. Um, and then also maybe, you know, even establishing that relationship with a large institution close by so you at least have a colleague that you can call a friend if you really need, to, need some help managing. We have time for a couple more. Just let's see. Was one th one question about why do we not give um, patients that have target uh, specific targetable, um, let's say EGFR mutation or ALK mutation, why don't we start with the IO therapy with them? And I mean, I think all of us could say it's like once they have that, we know that they've got a driver mutation. That absolutely is the frontline therapy for those for those patients, and they will respond best to that from the from. You the want to lead with your best foot forward, right? The other thing is that now the data have emerged that especially EGFR and ALK, when you do get around to immunotherapy, it's also very weak sauce. Like the response rate to single agent immunotherapy, we're talking about less than five percent. So I'll give it almost as last ditch before hospice, but it's not going to be one of the first few lines of therapy. And then finally, the other point that's really important is that patients who, let's say you get the PDL1 back really fast, you have a high PDL1, you get excited, you give the immunotherapy, and then you get the genomic testing result like, oh shoot, they have an EGFR mutation. You want to switch to osimertinib. Osimertinib plus immunotherapy equals not just additive, but synergistic terrible pneumonitis risk. So you've actually iced out osimertinib for a few months. So it's one of the reasons we really kind of teach that it's important to get the genomics back, maybe with the exception of squamous cell or heavy smoking patients. But you want all the totality of information in front of you because if you have that patient who needs targeted therapy, you don't want to have kind of saddled them with the immunotherapy that's ineffective and could make their targeted therapy less effective. So that's kind of the important point yeah. there. Important for educating patients about expectations when you do those genomic testing. The PDL1 testing, because it's immunohistochemistry, comes back very quickly. Um, and EGFR and ALK and some of the other mutations might actually can take up to 10 days and even two weeks, to, unfortunately, to get the results. So we have to kind of let patients know, sorry, you have lung cancer, but we have to, we have to wait, you know, to, to start your treatment until so we can be the best and most effective treatment. So nice. Um, so I think we've kind of run out of time. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Um, we really appreciate it. This activity is certified by PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids.